Live from the JSA Podcast Studio, presenting Data Movers, showcasing the leaders behind the headlines in the telecom and data center infrastructure industry. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Data Movers, our podcast series. I'm Jamie Scott Okataya, founder and CEO of JSA. And with me, as always, and so best to have my co-host, top B2B social media influencer, the fabulous Evan Christel. Hey, Evan. Hey, good to see you as always. And welcome everyone to Data Movers, where we sit down virtually with the most influential folks in our leading telco and data center and cloud world supporting the network infrastructure requirements of this new normal. But before we jump in, Jamie, were you, were you a big investor in Facebook? I, I hope not. I thankfully, uh, yeah, missed that that one. Um, yeah, I'm I'm watching these headlines and that's- I'm glad to see. Cool. Yeah, it was a pretty brutal few weeks for Facebook, AKA Meta. I think they lost about $170 billion or thereabouts in market cap. And uh, looks like we have achieved peak Facebook. Yay. By the way, it's my personal opinion <laughs> coming through. What about you? Do you still use Facebook and Insta and all the meta, you know, WhatsApp products, services? Uh, not the way I think I should have been, could have been, would have been. I. It's like I put a, it's like a, you put a flag in the sand, like you're, you're there just in case people are looking for you. You kind of want to know if someone's talking about you, but it's not something I go to. It's not my fun platform for me. It's not my. Yeah, not too much fun over. happening. I, I would no. agree. And even the cool kids now have have moved on to TikTok and oh, you know, know. people like us and B2B are on uh, Twitter and LinkedIn. So what do you think? Is, is there a role for, for Facebook? Uh, aka meta moving forward in our world let's say of of enterprise and b2b tech uh, i mean it needs to it needs to kind of spruce itself up a bit I, you know i think i heard zuckerberg in an article say oh well there's two reasons for 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 this one is that you know there there might be a uh a, a max of all the people like they they just haven't gotten new users lately and two he sort of started blaming tiktok which was a weird thing to see a CEO do, kind of. So, um, yeah. <laughs> and I take it I you're not a heavy. Want to go to TikTok, right? Like that's. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not understanding a strategy there. But you, with everything on the internet, uh, especially these days, I, you know what? Meta is a cool go- concept. I wonder how long. There's like a few years, I think, until we're actually there. So it's. Is he a little ahead of his time? Who knows? You can't. Never discount him, I would say. Never I'm guessing him. you're not wearing a uh, Oculus VR for hours a day, if I'm just guessing. That's well, my hunch. I mean, no, and it's hard enough <laughs> for a two-year-old to get her out of an iPad for like, you know, like through straight. So, I mean, that's scary, you know, like people are putting ads on the sidewalk because people are looking down on their phones. And, you know, I think maybe also the pandemic forcing folks to like, regroups, you know, stay back, spend more time with family. Maybe there's a little shift in like balance, need for balance. I don't know, but it's all cutting edge. Technology is going to drive us forward. And actually that kind of brings us fabulously to our guest because we are talking to a futurist today. So yeah, can I, should I just, all right, let me bring him in. And he's amazing. Founder, CEO, and Chief Scientist at AGI Innovations and iGo.ai. We're talking with Mr. Peter Voss. Hey, Peter. Hi. How are you? Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. We have summer coming back here in Los Angeles, so that's nice. Uh, Welcome, Peter. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you. You cannot beat these LA weather. It's fabulous. Uh, I mean, but you can't leave SoCal. Once you get here, it's like, <laughs> just soak it up and this is plant, plant your home here. Okay, rub um, it in, rub it in. Sorry, sorry, sorry. But back to Peter. Peter, you are, of course, a serial entrepreneur, an engineer, an inventor, a pioneer in artificial intelligence. Um, and so, of course, studying intelligence, that's, that's pretty, it's, it's an intelligent thing to do. Um, and how to replicate it within software back when AI was in a very conceptual phase. Um, so uh, actually that could be a, a good tie-in with, with Meta. Um, what, uh, what do you think about all this and what drove you to specialize in this type of research? 
Yeah, so um, I actually started out as an electronics engineer. Um, so I understand, you know, hardware. And then, then I fell in love with software. Mm. Um, and my um, hardware company, my electronics company turned into a software company. I developed an ERP software package. Um, that became quite successful. You know, we grew rapidly to 400 people, did an IPO. So that was super exciting. Um, but it's, it's when I uh, exited that company, I thought, what do I really want to do? What big project do I want to tackle? And what struck me is that software really is quite dumb. And I'm saying that I was very proud of my software that we developed, you know, it was uh, excellent software, but still, if the programmer didn't think of some scenario, this, the software would just, you know, give you an error message or crash maybe. Um, there's no intelligence inherently in software. There's no common sense. Software doesn't really learn. So that is what, what struck me. And I want to say, can we solve that problem? Can we make software intelligent? You know, can we have software that can actually have common sense, that can de have deep understanding, that can learn from, you know, from how you interact with it and so on. And, and that is what got me started on uh, studying intelligence and um, artificial intelligence. I actually took off five years to deeply understand intelligence um, from many different aspects, you know, starting with even philosophy, epistemology, theory of knowledge, you know, what is reality? How do we know anything? How can we be certain of things? You know, and how do we, how do we achieve knowledge? How do we achieve certainty? How do children learn? How does our intelligence differ from animal intelligence? And uh, what do IQ tests measure? All of those different aspects of intelligence to really deeply understand the concept of intelligence to be able to then uh, introduce that into software, to, to build software that has intelligence. And so after you know, about five years of doing my own research, I then started off my first R&D company in then implementing these ideas and these insights that I, that I got. And this then over many years uh, transitioned into a commercial product, uh, a conversational AI product. And that was my first AI, commercial AI company. Um, and you know, we learned a bunch from that. I exited that company and we went uh, and developed the core technology further. And we've now commercialized the second generation of this technology in Iger.ai, basically um, intelligent conversational AI. Yeah. That's fantastic. And I actually just learned today that you personally are known in the industry for coining the term AGI, artificial general intelligence. Um, which I'm excited about because I am waiting for my personal Jarvis, you know, from Iron Man. This is Robert Downey Jr.'s uh, uh, personal assistant. I just can't wait to have one. So, but but describe what AGI means, how it's different from AI, and mm -hmm. when am I going to have Jarvis? That that's the most important thing. We're working on it. We're working on it. Uh, <laughs> but it, it it would it would help. It would actually help if you could maybe you know give us fifty million or so. That would definitely accelerate. <laughs> Uh, 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 what's your Bitcoin wallet? I will get that. Through, uh, right <laughs> yeah, away. knew you were going to turn um, it into. Okay, I'll, I'll send that to you. <laughs> right. Um, so um, yes, AGI. I I coined the term in two thousand and two together with two other people, um, and the whole idea behind you know why do we need why do we need this new term artificial general intelligence or AGI, and how this came about is if you actually go back 60 years, 60 plus years, when the original term artificial intelligence, AI was coined, it was really about building machines that can think and learn and reason the way humans do. So it was having human-like, human-level intelligence. And you know the, the original founders thought they could crack this in a few years. You know, and this was in, I think, the 50s, late 50s. Uh, or early 60s, I don't remember. Um, and of course, it turned out to be much, much, much harder than, than, than that. So what happened over the decades, the AI really turned into what is narrow AI. And there's, it's actually a, sort of a subtle shift, but it's very, very profound and very important. So what happened is people picked one particular problem that kind of they thought, well, this requires intelligence. Let's solve this one problem and call this AI. 
you know, that's AI. And that's really what AI has been doing over the last 50 years or 40 some, some years is solving narrow problems. But the profound uh, difference there is that it's not actually the AI solving the problem, it's the programmer or the data scientist solving the problem. So for example, one of the big breakthroughs we had was uh, IBM uh, building uh, Deep Blue, the, the world chess champion. And it was really the, the, the programmers who figured out how they could write specific programs to use the power of computers, the, you know, the vast number crunching capabilities of computers and use, utilize it in a, in a very clever way to play a really good game of chess. But the, the chess program doesn't really have any intelligence in the way we understand it in humans. It was able to play chess, but it couldn't even play checkers. You know, and if you change the rules slightly of chess, it would, you know, fall down. And th this is really what's been happening in AI, is solving very narrow problems, but they are actually solved by the intelligence of the programmer and the, the data scientist. And we are still there today, you know, even, even with, um, you know, the Go World champ, uh, Chess Champion or Protein Folding or all of the, the, the fantastic breakthroughs we are, we are having in AI today, it's narrow AI. It's not really what the original idea of, uh, of artificial intelligence was. So in 2002, I, I got I realized this and got together with some other people who had similar ideas, and uh, we decided to publish a book on the topic to get back to the original dream of AI to build thinking machines. Right. And we decided we really needed a, a, a separate term to distinguish what we're doing from what everybody else in AI is doing. So we came up with artificial general intelligence. Um, and, you know, it, it surprised us actually that the term sort of caught, caught on. And now it's, you know, very commonly used to describe human level or human like intelligence. And that's what I've been working on really for the last 20 plus years. And, and so kind of begs the question, but can you tell us about any of the AI technologies you're currently working on uh, at igo.ai? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, there's actually, I can, I can give a very quick rundown in terms of, you know, also the differences and how narrow AI is done by pretty much everybody in the field of AI and how AGI needs to be done. Uh, DARPA came out with a presentation a few years ago that they called the, the three waves of AI. Hmm. And uh, what the three waves are, the first wave is what's also called good old fashioned AI. Those are basically primarily logic based approaches. So, you know, formal logic and it's all about logic reasoning. And again, Deep Blue, the chess playing system, was, was, is, is a good example of, uh, of that. So that was the first wave of AI. Now, the second wave of AI is basically big data statistical systems, also deep learning, machine learning. And that second wave hit us like a tsunami about nine years ago when some of the big companies like you know, Google and Amazon and, and, and uh, uh, IBM, Facebook, uh, figured out how they could use massive amounts of data and massive amounts of computing power to build these um, AI models. Uh, and that's really what deep learning, machine learning is. And that's given us you know, tremendous breakthroughs in terms of image recognition, speech recognition, and of course, the trillion dollar business of targeted advertising. Um, you know, which is driving this whole deep learning, machine learning. But that's the second wave of AI. So first and second wave are really narrow AI. The third wave that DAPA described is um, a, a, a cognitive architecture where your starting point is what does intelligence, you know, human-like, human-level intelligence require, the flexibility that we have. And so you, you then build a specific architecture that uh, in, encompasses the, the requirements of intelligence and you know that's basically what uh, our approach has been and so we have a cognitive architecture that has the ability to learn interactively as you're interacting with the world uh, it can reason about it it has some common sense and, and so on and so uh currently you're, you're sort of working on that third phase and then what has that process sort of taught you about intelligence in the brain yeah, so uh, 
you know, one of the things that, uh, I mean, there, there are quite a few sort of technical um, aspects to it, but one of them is that um, common sense reasoning and common sense knowledge are, are really an important part of it. And it, that's very, it's very fuzzy. And, you know, the, the, the information we get from the world is often contradictory, it's incomplete, and, you know, and it's, 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 it's not clean knowledge like you would expect in a, out of a database. So you need the system to be able to uh, deal with that kind of incomplete contradictory knowledge and knowledge that changes and you know, can change uh, all the time. And for that, you, you need metacognition. You need to be able to know when you don't know something or when you're not understanding things. So those are some of the you know, sort of more technical aspects of intelligence as such that, that we, you know, we understand better. So your system needs to be able to uh, deal with, with the, the messiness of the real world. Yeah. And it's funny, I have a 20 month old and I feel like her sort of her, her intelligence as, as she ages, mm -hmm. it's like, it's almost following what I, like the path of AI. <laughs> yes, there are, there are, there are definitely parallels in, in terms of making sense of the world, you know, and, uh, and, and, and learning. So, yeah, that, that's, that's really what, what we found. And, you know, we, we've now incorporated that into our, you know, commercial product. Fantastic. Can't wait to try it. Well, you know, many people say that AI and hyper-personalization is the future of marketing as well, which is where I live. And to take it a step further, you know, customer engagement, support, customer service, um, I just want a bank that actually knows who I am without my mother's maiden name, maiden name and <laughs> entering my account and phone number in for the eighth time. But uh, well, how do you think AI, you know, can offer sort of hyper personalization in these contexts? Yeah, I mean, that's very, very much in our wheelhouse. You know, what, what we are focusing is, is conversation, hyper personalized conversational AI. Um, and you know, the way we describe it is a chatbot with a brain. Um, now, you know, people are used to chatbots, but they don't normally have a, a very good opinion of them because often you don't Yeah, they're have pretty a, terrible. I'll, I'll say yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. And the reason for that is because they don't have a brain. So we have a chatbot with a brain, you know, that can actually deeply understand what you're about, use the context of, and, you know, use short-term memory, use long-term memory. So it will remember what you said you know, um, early in the conversation, or it'll remember what you said last week or last month or last year, and it can reason about things and ask you to clarify things if, if you don't understand them. So um, at the moment, personalization is, is pretty much done statistically. You basically fit a certain demographic, you fit into a certain bucket, you know, of people with your profile also like this or also want that. And we know that's pretty awful because, you're not just a number, you're not just a statistic. And even though quite a few of the things may match the profile, they ask very specific things. You say, well, no, I really don't like this or I've already bought this or I really like something else that wouldn't really normally be in, in my profile. So having hyper-personalization, personalization at the individual level is, is definitely the, the, the future. So, you know, one of our, one of our big customers is 1-800-Flowers, and uh, they're actually a group of uh, about 12 companies, Harry and David and Popcorn and, you know, Chocolate and, and so on. And uh, the, the, the founders of the company actually came to us and they said, when we started the company, we were one, just one shop and we knew all of our customers. Now we have over 10 million customers. How can we give that kind of personalized uh, service to an individual. And, and that's what we can achieve with this chatbot with, with the brain, this hyper-personalization, that basically when you engage with, um, with, with Igo at, at, at 1-800-Flowers or companies like that, um, you can then say, I want, to buy a, uh, I want to buy chocolates as a birthday gift for my, um, for my cousin Jane or something. And uh, the system will then know that you buy chocolates for a birthday for a cousin and cousin is called Jane. And that information should now be remembered for you specifically 
and be available in, you know, later on in the conversation, in future conversations, maybe a year later, well, is the birthday coming up again? You know, did you like the, the, the chocolates? And, and so on. So that is really, um, you know, absolutely the, the future. That's what people expect, not that they're just a demographic um, and, and, you know, you just get bombarded with things that people like you <laughs> may like. You know, it's your individual personality. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a customer of 1-800-Flowers, and I can tell you they draw me back in because they'll be like, you know, what's coming up? So-and-so's birthday, and I'm like, all right, yes. And remember last <laughs> time you, you, you know, you sent this. You want to do it again? I'm like, yes, click, good, done. You know, right. so they remind me of the thing that should be on my to-do list, and then they help me cross it off. I'm, I'm, I'm in. All right. Know? Yeah, and, and we're adding the, the sort of conversational part of that now that, you know, we are, we are, we are introducing there. And, but, you know, we see that's really the future as with all, you know, companies that we're working with. That's the kind of service they want to, want to provide. And then, of course, on the other hand that you, you mentioned, you know, uh, support, giving support and call centers. I mean, all big companies are having a, a hell of a time getting uh, you know, the right, the qualified staff, the correctly trained staff to be available, uh, to be available at peak times. I mean, we all experience where you, you know, try to get support and you're on wait, you wait for 20 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour, you know, um, whereas with the right kind of AI, you know, the third wave and intelligent AI, there's no wait time. And it's as if you're talking to the same agent when you call back. And the agent actually remembers what you were talking about last time, you know. So it's it's actually wow. it's not just about it's not really just about saving money. Yes, you save money, but you're actually providing a better service than a human can. Yeah, I'm this episode is brought to you by One Eight Hundred Flowers. <laughs> no, no, I mean this is also <laughs> so current, though. I mean, I was literally like on a healthcare. Uh, you know, I put dialed in my number. And they were supposed to call me back. They never called me back. I, you know, I could. And anyway, um, so it's every it's every industry. It's airlines. Yeah, and and we can insurance. we we can yeah. do better. The technology exists now, yeah. uh, and companies just need to step up and and you know Next. use chatbot with a brain. And you know what? Uh, this kind of brings us to our rapid fire part of our of uh, data movers, which I love, where we ask you crazy questions, and the first answer mm -hmm. that comes to mind. Mm -hmm. spread it out <laughs> mm -hmm. and you know I'm thinking about AI and, and it really has just moved its way into the big screen many Hollywood films of course uh, and for for you know quite some time now um, so tell us which one is your favorite movie or TV series but we're, we're not a particular mm -hmm. but which one that features AI in the storyline that you love well there's actually quite a lot of them that that I really really like that's it's hard for me to remember all of them um, a bicentennial man, I thought was 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 really well done, and then of course her. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of uh, good movies, but I, I always get very disappointed. I mean, bicentennial man and her. I, I like the first part of the movie, and I, I hated the ending. Right. And bicentennial man are the second part of it, and the reason I hate the ending is it's either AI is the bad guy, you know, uh, that's what it turn, turns out. Or the AI wants to become a human and, and become mortal, uh, you know, or, or something like that. And it's just so wrong. I mean, it's you know, it's not it's not the way I see AI. I think uh, in Japanese culture you have a much more positive view of robots and 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 AI. Uh, but but yeah, I, I like uh, I liked her in terms of that personal assistant. In fact, I, I just want to elaborate a little bit in terms of where I see technology going. So the one is. You know, we're talking about corporations, uh, the hyper-personalization you were asking about, hyper-personalization at the corporate level. But there is an, another phase which we're also working on, and that is what we call a personal, personal assistant. Mm. Uh, and it really could be called a personal, personal, personal assistant. And the reason for that is three different meanings of the word personal. Personal, that you own it. It's yours. It serves your agenda, not some mega corporation's agenda. Uh, secondly, it's personal that it's hyper-personalized or hyper-customized to you. It knows what your preference are, your history, and so on. And the third personal is the uh, privacy issue, that things are personal, that you can 
trust entrusted your deepest secrets basically and you decide uh, what you share or what it shares with 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 whom so that that is when the personal assistant um, it basically becomes yours because right now you know we have siri and alexa and so on but you know siri is probably not going to tell you about the latest samsung phone you know and alexa is probably not going to tell you about a special at walmart you know and they you know they are owned you you get them for free, but you're selling your soul. And yeah. I think we need to get away from that. I'm going to go rewatch uh, War Games uh, with Matthew Broderick back in the <laughs> 80s. That was a great AI movie uh, with, with a kind of optimistic ending. But uh, it's a fun topic. I could spend three hours talking about AI in movies. Right. I have to do another episode. Yeah. But uh, what, uh, shifting gears, what, what advice would you give to young tech entrepreneurs who are just starting out? <laughs> Yeah, if I think think back of, um, you know, sort of the biggest regret I have is I started my first business when I was 25. I wish I would have started 10 years earlier. You know, I, I think if you want to be an entrepreneur, if you want to, you know, have your own business, if that's in your DNA or whatever, wherever it comes from, um, the sooner you can start, the better, because there's nothing like actually doing it. You know, if you're doing it part time or you're partnering with somebody, but if, if you're an owner or part owner, you know, you have that responsibility, uh, especially in a small company, and you just have to figure out how to do things you know how to deal with suppliers people customers you know and uh yeah the sooner you can learn that the, the better the the other thing is it's really really helpful if you can have uh, one or two partners in the business that you really trust and that you know obviously they all need to contribute um but having a partner in the business um or two partners one or two partners is really really helpful mm. Um, what about to advice to them. old entrepreneurs like myself? No, just kidding. We'll, <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll just leave with the young folks. Right. No, well, uh, it's a thing like here in California, I'm looking at preschools that feed into elementary schools and they have um, uh, it, uh, entrepreneurial class on Mondays. I'm like, sign her up now. Like, is that like crypto for toddlers? Is that is what's, what's <laughs> going on there? No, like, right. <laughs> and it's not, it's not for everyone. It's not, you know, it's not for everyone to be an entrepreneur, but it's more and more, um, uh, you know, obviously now it's not that you get a job at GM and you spend the next 60 years there or 50 years or 40 years be, and then retire with a gold watch, you know, I mean, it, it's now uh, people do take much more responsibility of managing their, their careers. And um, so, um, yeah. And with um, entrepreneurism, is that a word? Yes. Uh, and AI aside, uh, what other modern technology could you not live without and why? Oh, uh, you know, obviously computers. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I, I mean, it's, we're so used to so many things. I mean, the internet is, you know, um, going yeah. back now and not having an internet, uh, not having a computer, um, yeah, that, that'd be pretty weird. I, you know, I think that about like, my college years, which did, mm. didn't really have that. Like, you know, I think I brought a word prep now, now we're really dating myself, but, mm. um, and, and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, how, how are these, it, how do you not get an A these days? You're, you're, you have your little laptop in class. You can just bring up any answer quickly. Like it's a, it's a whole new world. Oh, Jamie, you're, you're older than you look. Wow. That's oh so God. Yeah. Work. Well, <laughs> yeah. The camera, the angles, the, the lighting. Yeah. Now, what about, no, uh, it's a, yeah. It's a, I mean, it's, it, it's just amazing the technology that we have. Uh, you know, I started when I started business, there wasn't even such a thing as a PC it didn't exist, you know, and, uh, yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to go back there. No. <laughs> so, Peter, uh, just diving a little deeper, what what uh, three words would uh, you use to describe yourself? There's a bit of a trick question. Um, passionate. I'm passionate about what I'm what I'm doing. I'm I'm, I'm, I'm driven. I'm uh, curious, and uh, I guess a fourth one, adventurous. You have to say innovative. Well, yeah. <laughs> only three words. We only have three Sorry. words. Okay. 
All right, you, you pick All them right. then, you pick them. <laughs> and last question, last question, and then we'll, we'll stop torturing you, but what is your favorite activity or hobby when you really just want to disconnect from technology? Fast motorcycles. Oh, wow. would not have expected that. <laughs> Wild side with Peter, I like that, I like that. Yeah, that's fine. Well, well thanks so much, Peter, for joining us. That was really fascinating. I personally could spend another couple hours doing a deep dive, but we'll have to leave that for another time. Yes, yes. Right. Hopefully well, we'll yes. Thank you. This was fun. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So, hey, everybody, if you enjoyed this Data Movers podcast as much as we both did, um, be sure to check out jsa.net slash podcast for upcoming episodes every other week on Wednesday mornings. And be sure to follow us. Check us out. Where can they go, Mr. Evan? Yeah, uh, Evan Kerstell on Twitter and Jay Scotto on Twitter. And it's actually us. We actually will respond. So tweet yeah. us. Yeah, absolutely. And as always, guys, stay safe and happy networking.